This is lecture 13. In this final lecture of the course, we're going to discuss one of the most harmful and at times infuriating social psychological phenomena, prejudice. We will start in this first part by talking about definition of prejudice, and also we talk about how we can measure prejudice in people. So, uh, first of all, the definition of prejudice. Well, prejudice is considered uh, a negative or sometimes even hostile approach, attitudes towards people in a distinguishable group, only based on their group membership. So, you approach, you have an attitude towards people simply because they are part of a certain group. And prejudice is oftentimes negative. Um, so, prejudice is an attitude. And we extensively talked about attitudes in lecture seven. So hopefully you still remember what an attitude is. An attitude actually consists of three different components, cognition, affect, and behavior. So it means that with an attitude, you have a cognitive part, and that's basically the knowledge you have about uh, this specific uh, subject. We have an affect, so we have a feeling about it. And we also show behavior that is oftentimes either approaching this attitude object or avoiding it. So what does this look like with prejudice? Well, for prejudice, I think you will see some, some concepts that you recognize. The cognitive part of prejudice is stereotypes. So stereotypes basically capture all the knowledge that we have about people from a specific group. Then affect means the emotions that people, members of that certain group evoke. And discrimination means the behavior that we show towards members of that group because of their group membership. So these three components all together uh, uh, basically uh, uh, are captured under the umbrella term of prejudice. So let's first of all talk about stereotypes, this cognitive uh, part of uh, prejudice. So stereotypes are basically generalized ideas that we have about some groups and the members of that group, uh, ideas of what, what the members of this group are like. And sometimes stereotypes can be very helpful. So let's consider uh, a moment that you are waiting in a restaurant. You're there with some friends and you're very hungry and you want to order food. Then you use your stereotype, uh, stereotypes about a waiter to figure out who you should ask uh, for uh, to, to take your order. So if a person that looks like this approaches your table, you probably use social categorization in order to place this person into a, a category, uh, and this category is in this case a waitress, and you use this information to uh, ask this person, so can I please uh, order some drinks or order some food? So this is of course very useful, it's great. And actually stereotypes are heuristics, and we already talked about heuristics, uh, and heuristics are awesome because they are mental shortcuts uh, that we can use to automatically show certain behavior. So we use our stereotypical knowledge, we see this person walking by our table and we just say, hey, uh, I want to order some food. And that can be good if this is indeed a waitress. Maybe this isn't a waitress at all and then we make a very poor judgment. And um, that's also, again, the downside of heuristics and also the downside of stereotypes that sometimes our information is incorrect. And sometimes we place people in a certain category that they don't belong in. Or sometimes the stereotypical information is completely off. It's just not correct. And we judge people based on information that is uh, not uh, correct. So I already mentioned that a lot of these stereotypes are negative. We have oftentimes negative ideas about people, especially members from different groups, groups that we are personally not part of. Sometimes uh, parts of these stereotypes are also positive. So, uh, for example, we talked about the halo effect in lecture four, this stereotypical idea that beautiful people also have other uh, good positive qualities. So, in a way, uh, the halo effect, uh, the idea that beautiful people are good is also a stereotype, but also uh, from certain members of, of groups. For example, uh, the black stereotype is also associated with uh, being very athletic and very uh, sporting, excelling in, in sport tasks. Uh, and the Asian stereotype is related to being good at math. And the, and the, uh, the female stereotype is uh, related to being very good at domestic tasks and caring and, and doing the household. These are in itself positive traits, positive qualities, but still they are hurtful. Uh, and that is because these positive traits, these positive parts of the stereotype 
are overgeneralizations. They basically say that if you're part of this category, if you are Asian, then you're probably very smart. Maybe you're not smart, and this is actually very bad for your self-esteem. Or you want to be seen as something else than this smart Asian kid. So you want to distance yourself from that certain uh, stereotype. It denies individuality, and that's basically one of the big problems that we have with stereotyping. Um, also, we know that um, if people use these positive stereotypes, so, oh, you're a woman, you're probably an excellent cook, then they also probably endorse a negative stereotype. So overall, stereotyping is just bad overall, even if it's positive uh, stereotyping. So um, the reason why stereotypes are so problematic is also because they have the tendency to stick. So in the beginning of, of uh, this course, in lecture three, we talked about the many ways in, we, uh, in which we try to reaffirm our pre-existing beliefs. And this is called confirmation bias, remember? So if we have a certain idea about a group of people, for example, then we look for information that, this, uh, that proves that we are indeed uh, correct. So if we have an idea that, uh, that uh, people uh, from uh, uh, a certain outgroup are lazy, for example, we look for evidence that, that um, uh, convinces us that we are indeed correct. And we are ignoring evidence that's showing that it's not correct. And these, these beliefs also linger, even if we are corrected, and even if people tell us this information is incorrect, we have these processes of belief perseverance, or the perseverance effect, showing that you know, even if the information is later on turned out to be incorrect, these ideas still linger. So stereotypes are very, very persistent. Um, and one reason why they are also very persistent is because they often entail a lot of emotions. People feel, feel very strongly about people, members of certain groups. Not of all groups, but certain groups evoke very strong emotions. For example, the group over here, especially after 9-11, uh, uh, and a lot of uh, uh, terrorist attacks uh, across the globe uh, by uh, uh, Al-Qaeda or ISIS, um, we saw that there was a lot of stereotyping, a lot of discrimination also against uh, young uh, uh, Islamic uh, males. And, and this group was really high in affect. So a lot of people f felt very strongly about uh, young males uh, from Islamic uh, countries. Um, they felt uh, scared, uh, f so high in anxiety, but also a lot of times high in anger. And uh, if, if stereotypes evoke a lot of emotions, we also want to hang on to them. So we, we feel very reluctant to adjust our beliefs. So if we have a certain idea in our mind, we just stick with it. Um, and of course, the, maybe the biggest problem with stereotypes is uh, the moment that they turn into behavior. And this uh, happens automatically and often without us even realizing that we're doing it. So the moment that stereotypes leak into our behavior, this is called discrimination. So discrimination uh, is the unjustified negative or harmful action towards members of a group simply because they are part of a group. And for a long time, uh, discrimination uh, was legal. Uh, so here you see some, some examples that there were uh, different parts, for example, of a restaurant or of a bus or of a school uh, reserved for whites, uh, where uh, people from other skin colors could not uh, take place. And also there were different water, uh, a place to drink water for colored people and for white people. And uh, luckily, uh, these forms of open discrimination are no longer legal. Um, and I, I, I wish to say that this also meant the end of discrimination as it is, but that is unfortunately not the case. There are still many examples, even today, of discriminatory behavior uh, towards uh, especially minority groups. And um, this can take a form in, in many different ways, uh, sometimes very subtly. For example, we know that people tend to distance themselves from people from minority groups. They might be unwilling to work with this group, they might be unwilling to have them as neighbors, but also, for example, in public transportation, and I'm pretty sure you will also recognize this, even maybe yourself, that the moment you enter, for example, a train and you look for a place to sit, we tend to want to sit close to people that are part of the majority group, especially if we are also part of the majority group. And we tend to avoid people from minority groups. So we distance ourselves from this group physically. And this is actually already discrimination because you don't want to sit next to them. It's, it's not you know, calling them names or, or uh, prohibiting uh, them from coming close to you, but it's still discrimination. It's still very hurtful. 
Another example of, of sort of modern uh, discrimination is microaggressions. So here you see some examples of people experiencing microaggressions. So you're the whitest black person I know. Probably coming from someone that wants to, to pay this girl compliments, but it's, it's very harmful and it's, and it's very offensive and oftentimes people don't realize it. So, or people in a, in a, a homosexual relationship or um, uh, they, they are asked, so who is, the, who is the man and who is the woman in the relationship? So very hurtful comments and oftentimes stemming from ignorance that, that, you, that people don't realize that this is actually very offensive behaviors. Um, and uh, this is something that, that people have to live with if you're part of a minority group daily. And I think it's very important that we are all, especially if you're part of the majority group, become aware of these offensive uh, behaviors. Uh, on a more serious note, even, even though this is already pretty serious, uh, we also know that people from minority groups, especially from certain minority groups, are just in danger of their lives more than others because of discrimination. For example, discrimination from the police force. So here you see, these are numbers from the United States, uh, the percentage of people that, were ex the, that experienced uh, threats of use or, or use of force by the police when they were most recently approached by the police. And you see that whites just generally have a lower chance of experiencing threat or violence in, uh, 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 in a sort of a conversation or an interaction with a police officer. And especially blacks are most likely, especially young black males, to experience violence and sometimes even life-threatening situations or, uh, or lethal situations when they are approached by, uh, by the cops. And this might give you an idea that maybe the police in the United States is just are all racist, but it's not as simple as that. Um, it's something that a lot of people basically maybe even all people can suffer from, that the moment you see a person from a minority group um, maybe responding or behaving in a bit of an ambiguous way, we use our stereotypes to make judgments, and this leads to discrimin discriminatory behavior, as you can see in the following film clip. You see this and you wonder, did he lose his keys or is he blatantly stealing that bike? In broad daylight, he hammers and then saws on the chain. When that doesn't work, he pulls out an industrial-sized bolt cutter. And when he's asked, he messes up. You lost the lock? Uh, no, not exactly. But he's not a real thief. Justin Kelly is an actor, and our hidden cameras are rolling. What happened? Um, uh, nothing. I just, I can't get through the lock. I mean, I know it's weird, but you wouldn't happen to know whose bike this is. Yeah. All right, good. Thank you. It was odd that somebody had all that uh, that equipment. But you didn't do anything. No. That's true. That's the bottom line. Lots of people stop and stare. A few even question the actor. I guess I have to ask, is that your bike? I guess technically no. <laughs> okay. Okay. Bye. Good luck. Bye. In over an hour, about a hundred people pass by. Only George and Arlene try to stop him. Some tell us they plan to call the police later. Others say they're scared. Keep moving. This woman and her friends give our thief the benefit of the doubt. When we ask why, Bisa Washington tells us first impressions matter. I remember thinking young white men don't usually carry burglar tools. So we all that, make assumptions, huh? Yeah. I'm thinking maybe he works for the park. We replace our white thief with this young man, Matlock. Remember, both actors dress in a similar way and are about the same age. Mm -hmm. Is that your bike? Uh, nah. Then what are you cutting the chain for? Right away. Uh, right away, right away somebody right yelled. Wow. Within seconds, another person confronts our thief. Is that your bike? No. Technically, it's not, but it's going to be mine. More people converge. Is that on the south end? Will you call the police? He's like stealing somebody's bike. Are you taking that oh. bike? Is that your bike? Uh, no, it's not, sir. Oh, why well, are you, you doing that? It. Is this, I mean, is this any of y'all bikes? Is this your bike? It's my, it, it, it belongs no, to someone. No, but whoever's it is. It belongs to someone. To who? Well, well not to you. No. And sure enough, one man whips out a cell phone to call 911. Yeah, there's someone up to taking a bike here. Our actor triggers more reaction. Some people are even snapping pictures for evidence. I got you, bud. I got you. <laughs>
These racial stereotypes are infused in all of us. I mean, it's part of our culture. So whether you're black or white, you associate crime with blacks and you associate whites with being good. Jack DeVidio, psychology professor at Yale University. Whether we believe it, whether we notice it, whether we acknowledge it, race is affecting what I see, what I think, what I do. So the problem that is demonstrated in the video clip is that the stereotype blacks is associated with violence. And this is steering our social cognition. So this is influencing how we judge behaviors of blacks versus whites. And this is also shown in a lot of studies. For example, studies, uh, a study in which pictures were shown of either a black uh, a man or a white man, and this person was holding something. And sometimes this was a gun, or sometimes it was something else, for example, a tool. And participants were then uh, instructed to play a video game. And the video game was, um, they had to shoot a person that was holding a gun. So basically quite similar to a normal video game. So if you, if you see a bad guy, you shoot him. And when is a person a bad guy? It's a, if this person is holding a gun. And then you have several different conditions. So you have either a white person, a white man holding a gun or a tool, and you have a black man holding a gun and a tool. And you see how many errors people make. And here you see the results, and you see that uh, very convincingly, most people make errors if a black person, a black man, is unarmed. So they mistakenly shoot a, a man that is actually holding a tool and is completely innocent. And this is also what is happening in the police, and this is also what is happening uh, yeah, in, these, in these experiments. And this is, of course, very alarming. And it's just showing that we have this association that, that the black stereotype is associated with violence, with danger. And that is what is showing here. So if you have to make an automatic decision, you rely on this heuristic and you make mistakes because you perceive them as uh, violent and as having a gun, yes or no. Um, and basically, everyone has has a little bit uh, has a problem in that sense because this stereotype has been activated. In the Netherlands, it's not so much with blacks; it's, it's actually even more from with people from Moroccan descent, especially young males from Moroccan descent. They have the harshest stereotype here in the Netherlands, and we associate Dutch people associate um, young Moroccan males also with violence a lot, um, which can can also lead to this, to similar similar problems and behaviors. Uh, and even though everyone sort of suffers from this, there are some individual differences uh, in the amount of, of prejudice and the amount of um, discrimination that people show. And of course, researchers, psychologists have been very interested in, in studying these individual differences, and they've tried to do so in different ways. And one way of measuring this, this, uh, uh, this, this prejudice, sort of the hidden prejudices uh, that people have, is through the implicit association test. And uh, this implicit association test has been developed because prejudice is actually a very loaded topic, of course. And if you ask people, so how negative do you think uh, about, how, how negative is your attitudes towards young Moroccan males, for example? Some people would say very negative, they would be very open about it, but a lot of people would you know, feel like, oh, this is very social, undesirable to say that. So they would say something like, oh no, it's perfectly fine by me. But then simultaneously in the back of their minds, they think, well, uh, I don't want anything to do with them. So to get rid of this, this sort of social desirability in the answering, the implicit association test was uh, developed. And uh, I will show you a short video fragment in which um, you see uh, how this, uh, this test exactly works. Implicit association test, or IAT. In a classic version of the IAT, research participants are asked to make two types of judgments. The first is whether a face they see on the computer screen is that of a black person or a white person. And the second is whether a word they see on the screen is a good word or a bad word. A good word would be like love, joy, or honest. And a bad word would be like poison, agony, to test. The trials with the faces, black or white, are intermixed with the trials with the words, good or bad. And participants must use the same two keys on the computer for both judgments. So in one part of the test, participants will use one key to indicate black if a black face is shown and use that same key to indicate good if a good word is shown. Then a different key will be used for white for face trials and bad for word trials. In a different part of the test, things are arranged differently. Now participants use one key to indicate black and bad and the other key to indicate white and good. 
this experiment assesses how easily the participants can manage each of these links. Do they have an easier time putting white and good together, and so using the same key to indicate both, than putting white and bad together? It turns out that the second combination is easier for white participants and many African American participants as well. This seems to suggest that the participants arrive at the experiment already primed to associate each race with a certain evaluation and respond more slowly when the experiment requires them to break that association. So if you see the outcome of the IET, you see that some people have a very strong association between blacks and bads and whites and good. And for a long time, researchers thought that this IET outcome captured true discrimin discrimination behavior. Um, but this is actually no longer a case because a lot of research, follow-up research shows that the outcomes of the IET do not always predict behavior. So if you have a very strong association between blacks and bad, it does not necessarily mean that you also behave in a discriminatory way towards blacks. So it's actually measuring something else. What is, what is now the consensus is that it basically measures the strength of the association in the same way as that we associate b butter with bread or Ernie with birds, you know, that's just a combination that we're very used to. And some people have this association very strongly because they've been, uh, they've been watching a lot of Sesame Street, for example, then you have a very strong association between Bert and Ernie, guilty here. So uh, if you've seen, for example, a lot of media uh, in which uh, politicians, uh, some politicians uh, very openly uh, oftentimes link uh, violence to uh, young Moroccan males or males from uh, immigrants, ba basically young immigrants. Uh, if you've been exposed to this many, many times, even though you don't share this political out outlook uh, on these males, if you just if this association is strengthened, then you might have uh, an IET outcome that is very much in line with young Moroccan males and bad behavior, or in, in the US, uh, blacks and, and violence. But it might not be the case that you actually feel this way. So it's very important to know that it's only measuring associations, and it's not actually uh, sort of measuring hidden prejudice or hidden discrimination. So um, you might be interested in your own IET effect, uh, I can imagine. Um, and uh, I will upload a link um, on Canvas in which you can personally test your associations towards certain minority groups. So you can, you can take that uh, if you're interested.